It's, it's now my pleasure to introduce our first presenter, the Ombudsman of Ontario, Andre Marion. Andre became uh, Ombudsman of Ontario in 2005 and was appointed to a second term in 2010. His office conducts systematic investigations into issues affecting millions of Ontarians, from newborn screening to property tax to lotteries, and most recently into billing and customer service at Hydro One. Last year, the government passed Bill 8 to double his office oversight to include municipalities, universities, and school boards. Mr. Marion was named one of Can one Canadian Lawyers Magazine's 25 most influential lawyers in 2013 and in 2014, and received the Canadian Bar Association's John Tate Award of Excellence in 2012. Today, Mr. Marion is going to provide us with some insight into his new role as it will be shaped by legislation, and in particular, we look forward to his perspective on how his role will affect our education sector. I want to tell you that uh, Mr. Marion's uh, presentation is going to be videotaped as well, so you'll, you'll notice that. So ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, please join with me in welcoming Andre Marion. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and thank you for inviting me today. It's a unique opportunity to uh, talk about uh, our office and what uh, will be happening in the next few months. Now, if I can find my clicker for the slides, we should be all set. I don't see a clicker. Is that a clicker? It looks like uh, those old version walkie-talkies, mini walkie-talkie. Um, a couple of uh, comments before we get going. My voice may sound a little hoarse. That's a combination of asthma and bronchitis, pneumonia. Nobody knows exactly, but it's my f this is my first day back at work in 10 days. I didn't want to miss this opportunity. It's non-contagious, non so you, uh, you don't have to start leaving the room. Um, but uh, So I apologize in advance if I'm a little hoarse and uh, I'm coughing a little bit. Uh, the second thing I'm going to tell you is that this presentation um, is also being live tweeted under hashtag OOLive. So I encourage you to uh, follow us on Twitter. Twitter is uh, uh, at unt underscore ombudsman. And to feel free to tweet along using the hashtag OOLive. Um, Again, I think that, uh, and I was just having this conversation just before uh, I started I was having this conversation at the table, I think that uh, there are so many areas of commonality and basis for everyone to get along that I think this is a unique opportunity for you to get to know how we work. And I, I hope if I achieve anything today, this presentation, is that we can have this conversation outside of an area where there might be conflict arising. So a little bit about the Ombudsman of Ontario. It's an office that uh, is really uh, shaped by the Swedish parliamentary Ombudsman model of um, 1809. And that model is a really a unique model and it's referred to as the classical Ombudsman model. When you go to your, your banks, your universities, and so on. There's a lot of ombudsmen. I mean, God, there's going to be an ombudsman for beer now, of all ombudsmen. Those are called uh, corporate or institutional ombudsmen. Uh, Hydro One apparently is going to be taken away from our jurisdiction, and there'll be an institutional corporate ombudsman for Hydro. Well, these are not uh, true classical ombudsmen. The main characteristic or difference between the institutional corporate ombudsman and the classical ombudsman is that the uh, ombudsman, the classical one, enjoys a true independence, impartiality, the ability to conduct formal investigations, and the ability to report back publicly. Now, none of these features, and, and of course, statutory guaranteed confidentiality to the complainants. Now, none of these features are enjoyed by corporate institutional ombudsman who fulfill an important role, uh, albeit a very different role than your classical Swedish ombudsman. 
The first Ombudsman of Ontario, Arthur Maloney, 1975, he would have made me look like a pussycat. He was a very aggressive criminal defense lawyer, became Ombudsman, and uh, conducted himself in an exemplary way, but very aggressive, to the point where he scared off the then government of Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who had a bill in front of the parliament, federal parliament, to create an ombudsman. And then they said, oops, let's just forget about that idea. Look what's happening in Toronto. <laughs> you know. Now, I was appointed in 2005. Uh, no, I was not appointed when I was 18. I was actually 40, uh, which makes me 50 now. Uh, these are like when you look at the old Obama pictures. Eh? He's all black hair and whatever. Now he's all graying. You know? So when I look at these pictures, I'm saying, yeah, it's a fun job, but uh, you do age a little prematurely. And in fact, when I was reappointed in 2010, I received a call from the Speaker of the Legislature who is basically the, por the person I report through to uh, get to Parliament, and he said, okay, there's going to be a vote, because I'm appointed by vote of the legislature. He goes, uh, if you're interested, you can come down or, and, and uh, see uh, democracy in action, see the vote on your reappointment. So I said, yeah, yeah I'll be there. I'll j I'm just gathering all my friends. So you see all my friends came with me <laughs> to my reappointment. So what exactly do we do? <clears throat> we investigate complaints, recommend solutions, look at maladministration process. We're there not to investigate individuals. We don't uh, recommend, you know, this person should be fired or this person should be disciplined. We look at processes, make sure that the decisions which are made are not arbitrary, are not uh, capricious. So we call it maladministration in my business. We currently have oversight over 500 plus government ministries, corporations, agencies, boards, commissions, and quasi-judicial tribunals. A very, very vast jurisdiction, which is about to be more than doubled when Bill 8 is proclaimed. I'll be talking about Bill 8 in a moment. Actually, it's my next bullet. There you go. Uh, there are 444 municipalities in Ontario. There are 22 universities and 82 school boards, at least in my count. Uh, that's a huge, huge uh, sector in the broader public service, which we're about to uh, get jur jurisdiction over. Last year, we received 27,000 complaints. We have an office of 87 people. We conduct 82% of our investigations in two weeks or less. Now, it's important when you think of the Ombudsman, we are not an advocate for a particular cause or issue or complainant. Now, you might say, oh, I saw you on Twitter, you're talking about this, and taking positions on that, and what about your neutrality? And I hear this all the time. And the neutrality and impartiality applies when we start an investigation. But when we make recommendations, then the role shifts. We're there to advocate for our recommendations. So uh, you will see me as an advocate, wonder, oh, what's happened? He thought he was impartial. Well, yes, we are at first, but otherwise, if we don't exercise that moral suasion, what do you think would happen to our reports and recommendations and findings? They would end up on a shelf somewhere. So a, a, um, an effective ombudsman is someone who's out there, advocating for his or her findings and recommendations, trying to make a difference, trying to be an agent of change. An invisible ombudsman is an ineffective ombudsman and a soon-to-be unemployed ombudsman. We don't uh, act as a judge, tribunal, enforcement, office, or other things. And, the common traits, tribunals and judges, enforcement offices, they issue orders, they have executive powers that are subject to appeals. We only make recommendations. In no circumstance can I force anybody to accept my recommendation. And some people ask me, well, if we don't like what you say, where do we appeal? Well, that's the beauty of it. Because my findings and recommendations are non 
uh, obligatory. They're not uh, the executive. They're only recommendations. You can't appeal because the person with the power has the power to accept or reject the recommendations. The office is vested with very strong powers of investigations, which we rarely use, but uh, we use if, if necessary. We can compel, and this is all in our statute called the Ombuds of an Act. It's on our website if ever you are dying to read more about it. But we can compel witness interviews under oath, which we have done, rarely, but we've done. Compel the production of documents. This is all without any court order, simply uh, by direction of the Ombudsman. Ombudsman records cannot be accessed through freedom of information and are protected from court-ordered production, which is really important because when there's litigation, lawyers are tempted to say, well, let's go see what's in the Ombudsman's file regarding the ministry of whatever. And it's important that we have the ability to protect our information. And this section of our act has been subject to challenge, and it's always been very successful because the act is very clear. The Ombudsman's office cannot be held civilly liable. Again, very good protection so that when I issue a report, I can say what I need to say, do what I need to do, not always work under the fear of getting sued by one party or another. Next point, as I, I've loved to remind my six children over the years, resisting or obstructing the Ombudsman is an offense. <laughs> of course, that doesn't work with children. Oh, yeah, sure. What can you do? I feel like I'm in jail already. <laughs> and finally, there is no power to enforce recommendations. You know, we've had investigations um, involving municipalities, and in particular, one, London, Ontario. Anybody from London, Ontario here? Okay, you must know a lot about our office. Uh, you know, we had an investigation where, oh, city council, oh, the ombudsman from Bay Street, oh, let's hire all these lawyers from Bay Street so we can deal with him. And I kept telling you, you don't need lawyers, you don't need lawyers, you're not going to go to jail, all we make is recommendation on process. Oh, no, we want a lawyer. And the more I said he didn't need a lawyer, the more it sounded like, oh, my God, then we really need a lawyer. Because he's a lawyer, and, you know, we know what lawyers are like. So, okay, hire your lawyers, right? So, uh, anyway, so they insisted on hiring lawyers. And to us, we, I much prefer to deal with another lawyer, and we can talk lawyer business, and we have good rapport, good relationship, rather than dealing with counselors directly who uh, were throwing uh, pins in, in, in dolls with my face on them. So, but then the bill arrived, it was $96,000, and all the recommendations were accepted, and then uh, th these counselors had a hard time explaining uh, at election time where they'd spent $100,000 on a report where they agreed with all our recommendations, and that was the end of it. So all those councillors, including the mayor, did not uh, get re-elected. The only power we have as an ombudsman is the power of moral suasion. It's the ability to convince those in power to change the way they, uh, they, they behave, either change a decision, change a process, revisit a decision, that kind of thing. It's moral suasion. A lot has to do with advocacy skills, communications. Uh, this speech this afternoon is moral suasion. I'm talking to you about our work, and I have to convince you that we're we're on the side of the angels, and you know we, we all work towards the same goal. And when I issue a report, uh, like I will soon on Hydro One, and I heard when I was mentioned in the audience, I heard grumblings already. Tremendous amount of interest about our Hydro One investigation. That's coming out relatively soon. And when I table my recommendations and findings, <clears throat> uh, you know, I'm going to have to be compelling. I'm going to have to convince the government that there are changes that need to be done. I'm going to have to ch convince Hydro One about uh, things that need to change in the way they, they do business. And the way we do that is by having a press conference, having a, an intelligible report, colorful writing, reaching out to the media. Uh, and uh, that's what spells our effectiveness as an office, is that power to go out and, and having that, uh, that bully pulpit and be able to speak from a position of authority 
as someone who got to the bottom of things and um, trying to um, compel government to, when I say government, it includes all the agencies, boards, and commissions to change their decision to make sure that going forward they are uh, dealing with the, those issues. So things we see ourselves in our office doing is helping out with bureaucracy and decision making. We have an expression in our office and it's, a, it's an infection that's worse than bronchitis. It's called rulitis. It is the slavish adherence to rules at the expense of common sense. And being in the public sector, the broader public sector, I'm sure when I, I, I talk about rulitis, you can come up with ideas of like, oh yeah, that's right, that rule that nobody understands why it's there, but everybody follows, doesn't make any sense, that's the rulitis. You know, I recently, um, I was recently, um, I, I needed to produce ID, and we're trying to, situ trying to think of where it was. It was a very, very silly thing. Uh, was I at a bank or something? Anyways, I was at a bank, something like that, and I, I needed to provide ID for a transaction. And they said, uh, where's your driver's license? And I didn't have it. So I showed them my, my health card. And I said, just, all they, they don't, they're not taking numbers. They want to make sure your face matches with the ID on your card, government issued card. So I'm, oh yeah, I remember now. It was at Rogers. <laughs> I was trying to swap a modem for the new one, the Ignite one, okay? So my old one had all the serial number, it's on the system. She goes, I need a piece of ID with your picture on it. I didn't have my driver's license. Had my health card. I said, don't show me that. I'm not allowed to look. And I'm like, well, it's not like you're stealing it. It's my health card. I'm showing it. Well, no, no, put that away. Put that away. I don't want to see it. And I did not. I said to her, well, she goes, do you have any other ID? So I opened my wallet. Of course, Visa, Amex, whatever. There's no picture. It's not government ID. And she goes, oh, did, I, did I just see a Costco MasterCard? <laughs> I'm like, yes. Well, that has your picture on it. Fantastic. And she starts lecturing me that in Ontario, you're not allowed to show your health card. Now, I'm not going to get into all the Ontario ombudsman never heard of that. I just want my damn modem to get the hell out of there. <laughs> but my Costco MasterCard ID with my little picture on the back is what Rogers is an acceptable form of... ID at Rogers, my health card is not, even though I have my picture, government issued, and whatever. Go figure. So that's rulitis. And I, I haven't looked. I mean, maybe it is against the law. For I mean, I doubt it. I mean, it's my health card. I mean, if I decide to choose, I mean, I use it to board planes all the time. It's okay by Air Canada. And I've been lectured by people, oh, don't show your health card. But I mean, these people, are just, she didn't even use my number. She said, okay, that's you, no problem. I just give me the damn modem. <laughs> so as ombudsmen, we look for those things in the Ontario government, and there's always some stuff like that that just that doesn't make sense. Um, we like to provide, be a source of information. We have people calling us all the time what to do uh, about different things. So we refer people back to places that are there to help them. I mean, being the tax filing time of the year, I get all types of tweets and emails about my T4, my T5, and my government, of, you know, my federal government, and this, they want that. has nothing to do with our office. We are gladly refer back. We also have a lot of people who look for, to access things about the Ontario government. We're happy to help them. You know, all this translates into three kinds of interventions. One is the individual case resolutions. Uh, like, for example, like right now, um, in Hydro One, we are looking at about 11,000 complaints just dealing with Hydro One. We're still, although the investigation started February 2014, we are still getting about 10 fresh complaints a day. 
Um, so what are we doing is we're, we gather them in bunches and then we meet Hydro One people and we say, uh, can, you, can you fix this person's meter? Can you not send 10 bills on one day to this other person, please? Uh, so we, we're helping individually and in pushing the matter forward. We're also conducting parallel to that a systemic investigation as to how did we get there how, how, and how do we find the solutions to get out of the hole? And that is the, the, the uh, report that will be coming out is to dealing with the broader systemic issues. And the ones that fall in between, which are regular investigations of individual and systemic issues. Our office is divided in three sections. One is the early resolution team. They handle complaints um, dealing with uh, individual matters. Virtually 90% of our hires lately, regardless of the, the three sections, are, are all accredited lawyers. Uh, not because we advertise for lawyers, but lawyers tend to have better analytical skills. I say tend to, not always. And they score better on our testing. And uh, a lot of people like the fact we're sort of a nine to five kind of business. We're not private sector. You're not expected to work uh, 75 hours a week. So we offer a good environment, and uh, we've, uh, we normally hire these uh, lawyers into our early resolution team. When you call our 1-800 number, they are the people answering the phone. It's not like a receptionist saying, we'll, we'll get back to you in three weeks, we'll assign a file. The person who speaks to you on the phone has a job to resolve your issue. And there are three, t three teams of 10 people, and they rotate in and out of the phone. So one week you'll be on phone, the other week you're at your desk resolving the cases that you took while answering the phone. So the idea here is to keep the front-end staff motivated uh, and provide some variety and have them seize with the case to resolve it. So this could be anything from someone wanting their birth certificate to obtain a passport and been having the runaround from the government getting their birth certificate. So these are the kind of individual cases that are very important for us to resolve for individual people. The case requires more, more follow-up, more investigations. It requires a few phone calls, meetings, and whatever. Then it's bumped up to the investigations team. And if the case really is a systemic case, like the case of Hydro One, where we need to really go in depth, interview witnesses, gather transcripts of interviews, gather emails. I mean, we, we went to Hydro One and we said, we want, for the last few years, we want to have all your emails that raise issues of customer service. Anyone want to take a guess at how many emails we're talking about? It's more than one. And it's less than 152,000, 151,000 emails. So the Special Ombudsman Response Team is, uh, has been doing this kind of work for, for years, and uh, they do a fabulous work in uh, doing, like, hardcore investigations. And this is the type of cases where we might issue subpoenas and warrants uh, and compel witnesses to testify under oath. None of this had to be done in Hydro One because we received exemplary cooperation. It's normally when you get furthest from government, but the core of government, that we have cooperation issues because our office has existed for 40 years, and there's a corporate history. I mean, people know what the ombudsman is, what we do, our statute. So with the provincial government, there's uh, rarely an issue of cooperation. It's when we drift out of it into municipalities, have to deal with different issues. It's like, who's this guy? He had to tell me what to do. I was elected for four years. I'm accountable to my people who elected me. Who is he from Toronto? Like, we get this a lot when we do municipal investigations. And that's why, before Bill Aid kicks in, it's important for me to, to, to meet as many people uh, affected by Bill 8 who have not had relations with our office to make sure we can deal with uh, issues of... Uh, information and education and that's why I was so pleased to accept this invitation uh, just to talk to you briefly about two of our uh, completed uh, investigations one dealing with the lottery system and one dealing with uh, the um, unregulated daycares in Ontario in the game of tr in the in in the case of the OLG um, the, the case was sparked by, uh, and I'm going to, you know, allow me to simplify the facts. All these reports are online, so 
if you want to get the precise uh, version, but this is the Coles Node version to allow me to uh, share it with you in a speech. But here is Bob Edmonds, who's an 82-year-old man from a place called Coco Bank, Ontario. I've never heard of that place before. The interesting thing with my job is I get to learn a lot of things about geography that I never knew existed. But he's in Coco Bank, uh, Ontario, and he, uh, he's been buying the same lottery ticket from the same retailer for 20 years. And so, he, you know, he has his routine where he buys his morning uh, coffee at the retailer and uh, retailer, you know, swipes his ticket from last week, sells him another one. He's buying the same numbers for 20 years. One day he comes in with his uh, ticket, retailer swipes it. Ka-ching, ka-ching, you've won, you've won. Okay, retailer throws 10 bucks at him and says, have a good day. He's all excited. The next week he's watching, uh, he's reading his community newspaper and he sees his retailer holding a $250,000 check with his winning numbers. The uh, government, uh, this, is, this is him here, uh, Bob, Bob Edmonds. The government washed their hands of it. Okay, if you have an issue with your retailer, you deal with the retailer. Well, uh, I had a problem with that. And then the, uh, the, the government actually, so then Mr. Um, Mr. Edmonds sued the government. He spent more than $250,000. The government fighting him at every step of the way. But he was very uh, devoted to his cause. He wanted to see the end of it. Um, so we investigated it, and we found rampant fraud in the lottery system. Uh, you know, we found over a period of the last decade, uh, $300 million, I believe, uh, just disappearing in very suspicious circumstances. And then when we were doing our investigation, we were, again, we, we love to look at the record in emails. In the particular case, a vice president at the OLG had sniffed out that there was something illegal going on, that there may be fraud among the retailers and something was fishy was happening. And so he wrote to the CEO of the OLG, the then CEO, and said, what are we going to do? Because I, I think we have a problem here with fraud. And uh, the CEO reported that, well, sometimes you just hold your nose. You know the expression that the fish rots from the head down? We recommended some very exhaustive measures be taken. Like right now when you buy a lottery ticket in Ontario, it's nothing like before uh, 2007. Right now you've got to sign the front of the ticket, not the back. They won't be honored unless it's signed. If you win over a certain amount of money, the phone from the OLG rings directly into the retailer and you're basically kidnapped in the store. You know, so you're not let go. So the retailer has to give you the phone and say, yeah, you did win, you know, X amount of money. They've also installed self-swipers in retail stores. You go to go shoppers, drum or whatever, you can swipe your own ticket. You don't have to give it to a retailer. Retailers can't buy from themselves anymore. There's tons of stuff that's been put in place all directly because of our report. Uh, there was an OPP investigation right after uh, our report came out, they were following leads that we had identified, including a retailer who, um, uh, with, a, with uh, her family, had, uh, uh, was accused of uh, ripping off $13.7 million. They, they went from living in a basement somewhere in Toronto to a very luxurious palace close to here, actually. One thing is for sure, they have very good taste. They had very good taste. They didn't squander the money. And, you know, often we find in, in, in places like this that in our investigations that when we start and there's a lot of problems, there's a lot of defensiveness, defensiveness by the institution. There's a lot of howls and threats and, you know, uh, they get very upset that we're involved. And once the reforms are in, they realize, well, you know, that was tough medicine but uh, in hindsight, it had to be done. And this is what the OLG had to say um, a couple of years after uh, the report was made public. Our last published investigation was conducted as a result of four deaths in seven months in the GTA 
of children uh, dying in uh, unregulated daycares. And these are daycares, according to the old system, where if you had less than five kids under your care, you didn't need to register with the government. Therefore, all the regulations that applied did not apply. So people would say, oh yeah, I have less than five people. And next thing you know, uh, you know, they had 20, 30 plus, you know, a dozen dogs and, you know, chickens and you name it. Uh, very unsanitary conditions. Uh, and we found that the government basically uh, had no real enforcement of the section. So people, you know, kids were dying. And the key uh, case we looked at, uh, the... Um, the daycare was supposed to have be unlicensed, therefore under five children, had 29 children, 14 dogs, probably 30 rabbits, a couple of dozen chickens and whatever. Uh, there had been neighbors complaining, no action at all. Um, and um, the mess was so bad, I mean, it's really hard to believe, especially as a parent, I'm sure you understand as your position as, as trustee and involved in the school system, uh, it's really a horrendous kind of situation. We produced a report, uh, and the government knew the day we were producing the report and had a draft of it. But the day we produced the report, legislation was introduced implementing all 113 recommendations of ours. And people ask me, what's the most stimulating thing in, in, in your job? And, you know, Saving lives one way or another, I mean, that's a pretty cool job when you realize that the difference you can make. Now, let's get back to the mush sector the, in the last few minutes of the speech. Uh, in 19, way back, the first Ombudsman of Ontario, this guy, who would make, make me look like a pussycat, uh, basically acknowledged and wrote to the government a blueprint to change the Ombudsman Act way back in 1979, after completing three years. He told the government, you forgot to, in the act, include the broader public service made up of municipalities, universities, school boards, etc." And that existed uh, for many years. I mean, if you look at Ontario compared to other provinces, Although the, the act is wonderful in the tools that it provides, it provided a very small sandbox compared to the other provinces. So go play in your sandbox, but it's really small. If you look at uh, hospitals, for example, we are, were, and are still the only province where there is no jurisdiction over hospitals. So something had to be done eventually. And uh, I picked up the, the task of advocating for mandate reform. This is a citizen who just had these T-shirts done and was delivering pamphlets about enlarging our mandate uh, during, the, during one of the last elections. I mean, I remember walking by the street, my sunglasses and a hat on, saying, what? Does she work for me? <laughs> and of course, she was just one of those engaged citizens uh, I mean, it's quite remarkable because we've had complaints about the broader public service. We've had almost 20,000 since 2005, 130 petitions tabled in the Legislative Assembly, 18 private members' bills. I mean, a really incredible um, amount of focus. This is, uh, th these are all your current uh, legislative watchdogs in Toronto. Some of them have had jurisdiction over, like, uh, over hospitals. For example, um, the Auditor General has had it since 2005. So we needed to fix this uh, lapse in jurisdiction. And this is where our superhero Bill 8 comes into the picture. Forty years in the making, uh, finally our jurisdiction is included, is extended to include municipalities, universities, and school boards, a patient ombudsman, Corporate, institutional, remember the difference I was telling you earlier about classical ombudsman versus corporate institutional. The government chose the corporate institutional path for a health ombudsman reporting within the Ministry of Health Long-Term Care, reporting to a body known as Health Quality Ontario. We oversee all of that, so the argument is that person 
we'll do the, the first line of contact and I oversee that office and that's how it has been resolved. The biggest area of complaints about the, so now we don't call it the mush sector, we call it the mus sector. And this is the sector affected by Bill 8. The largest component of complaints are, are municipalities because I think we can agree that there is a general uh, concern about the functioning of municipalities in Ontario. Whether it's closed meetings in London, whether it's um, issues of integrity and ethics involving Toronto City Council, whether it's Brampton that always seems to be in the news these days. Uh, you know, in the last 24 hours, I've had to deal with the mayor of Castleman, in, uh, east of Ottawa, who's been having a fit over one of our reports. Uh, but there's all types of issues in Castleman. So whether you're in Castleman or Brampton or Ottawa, Toronto, uh, there are issues of uh, in integrity, mostly issues of integrity, allegations of corruption, that kind of thing. So municipalities are a really big area of concern, as I expect it will continue to be once Bill 8 uh, comes into force. So just to be clear, Bill 8 has passed, it's December 9th, 19, sorry, 2014, so it has passed through the legislature. However, it has not been proclaimed, which means it's law, unproclaimed law. So it's not in effect. When will it be proclaimed? Uh, we don't know. Uh, that's up to the government to do. I have advised the government that when they do make up their mind to proclaim the law, I've suggested that they do it in a scattered uh, implementation. So not give us mass overnight. Say, Ombudsman, now you got municipalities, universities, and school boards. I like to have it in, in three different uh, bites because the expectations of the public are very high and I would like the, the opportunity to manage the caseload that's coming in. Complaints about school boards. They've been on the rise. Does that mean there's an issue of concern for me? No, not really. Uh, I think complaints about school boards are on the rise because a lot of people are aware they were coming, and it's like, can I jump? Can I jump the queue? Can I just put my complaint in line? So some some issues have been bugging people, and because of that, they call us and they say, you know, I want to get in line for when your mandate kicks in. So I don't think the only thing we can read out of this is that people are are or more uh, informed that they know that it's coming and so they're they know now that uh, we will have jurisdiction one day and why not get my complaint in the queue so these are the various issues that uh, have come to our attention issues about student discipline inadequate special education supports and sufficient response to bullying poor communication, illegal closed board meetings, and limited complaint processes, which means, uh, for example, that someone feels that no one's listening or there's no way to be heard, that kind of thing. Now, you've heard um, and read the newspapers concerns about um, school boards in Ontario the, the issues that are facing school boards and those that the public are raising. So the question is, how would the Ombudsman's Office interact with school boards? Which I'm sure you're wondering about. So we are a neutral fact-finding office. In other words, someone comes to complain, we don't presume a complaint's founded. We don't uh, presume wrong. We presume good faith on behalf of the complainant. That doesn't mean uh, that the complainant is of good faith, but we presume good faith. We don't presume the complaint is founded. We give it an objective, impartial assessment. We are confidential. A lot of people, you know, I want to know the name of the accuser. I have a right, you know, to face my accuser. All these principles from criminal law gets all messed up into the Ombudsman's Act 
The Ombudsman Act is pretty clear. Okay, complaints are confidential. If you see names on our reports, it's because the complainant has asked or we've obtained consent, published the name. But the name of the complainants are not published. I know that in London, everybody wanted to know, oh my God, who's complaining? And I think it's him and her, it's my political rival. And you know, we're not, we, we're not uh, an office that's just fallen off the, uh, the turnip truck. We've been in this business in 40 years, so we know that, um, that tweet that, I know that was a good one. We didn't fall off. <laughs> We, just, we didn't just fall off the turnip truck. We've been around. So we know that some people use the office as, as uh, abuse the, the office. You know, we have a repeat complainant. We know that some of them are politically motivated. I mean, we're, we're pretty astute to that kind of stuff. Um, but it could be that it's a political opponent or a personal opponent, but they could still have a valid issue. So, you know, we assess all of that. We work as a last resort with existing complaint mechanisms. You know, Bill 8, you know, we see this uh, a lot in municipalities. Municipalities, there are 444 of them, of which 29 only, only 29, have integrity commissioners. This is since 2008, since they had the power to, to create them. Um, at one point, there were close to 10 auditor generals across Ontario for municipalities. As soon as they issue a negative report, they get fired. Uh, that's what an auditor general is supposed to do, right? They're not there as a cheerleader. Now there's only one auditor general outside of Toronto. And Toronto I keep to the side because they're obliged by law to have these positions. But in the 443 other municipalities that exist, only one has an auditor general now, and that's Ottawa. Does that mean there's no issues? Everything's perfect in all, all across Ontario? Uh, none of them have an ombudsman's office, only Toronto, which are now looking at merging it with other offices and, uh, you know, uh, all these other things. Uh, so my message to municipalities has been, this is not the time to get rid of your, your, your oversight mechanisms. But I know that some municipalities have said, oh, great, the ombudsman's coming. We don't have to spend money on uh, an integrity commissioner anymore. Well, no, that's not how it's supposed to work. Issues that can be addressed locally, should be addressed locally. They shouldn't be addressed by the Ontario Ombudsman's Office. It's more than an issue of cost. It's great that we're free. We're not free. You know, we are free and not. We have this argument that, well, you're not free, you're paid through our taxes, whatever. But we're free to municipalities, we're free to universities, we're free to school boards. But this is not an opportunity, because Bill is coming, to fold these offices. And I had this conversation with the Council of Universities and all the presidents for the 22 universities were there, and they're like, well, why are we spending money on our ombudsman's office when you're coming along? I'm like, this is not the time to close your offices. This is a time to strengthen local accountability officers and mechanisms so that they don't have to come to the Ontario ombudsman's office. You know, so if you have an ombudsman who's, you know, nobody goes to because they don't think they're truly independent, you know, create, strengthen the independence of the office so that it has more potency and credibility with your students. So that has been a message, and they were quite relieved to hear that, because if you think about it, these university presidents should favor a local system to redress grievances than someone running to Toronto. But as, I, as I've mentioned to many groups, just because you create your own mechanism, it doesn't take us out of the picture. We'll still be there, but when people call us, We'll say, okay, you're calling from University of Ottawa. Did you try your local ombudsman at the university? Oh, no, I don't trust them or whatever. Well, hold on. They're there to take the complaint. It's like, you know, you don't go straight to the Supreme Court of Canada with your first trial. I mean, you have, there's a process. So we will be really emphasizing the last resort so that issues that can be dealt with by trustees are dealt with by trustees. If there's any ombudsman in the school board system, they will be invited to go there first. And of course, we've talked about systemic work and the fact that our recommendations are not binding in any event. So these are points I was uh, these are points I was these are points I was I, I was making a few moments ago that we're not there to replace local mechanisms, and that it, it, that doesn't just include an ombudsman. I, I don't know. 
an organization can have a 1-800 complaints line, for example, or beef up their human resource section uh, and have a complaint function. Um, whatever, whatever works. And we will be working with the must sector the exact same way as we work with the entire government. Last resort, referral, um, ex exercising our discretion. <coughs> we, we've had oversight over provincial colleges uh, since day one. So when I talk to universities, um, I've had someone ask me, well, when are you going to get colleges? And I've said, we've had it since the last 40 years. You know, and we haven't uh, threatened freedom of, freedom of expression because that's one of the concerns about universities. Uh, what are you going to do about freedom of expression? Well, you, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. Um, and when a school board fall, is um, ordered under supervision, which has, had, which has happened from time to time, then we automatically get jurisdiction because the supervisor is appointed by the province. And we were, we've worked well with supervisors. I don't think anyone would tell you that we've had any issue because what happens is supervisors are appointed and everybody comes to us and say, well, of course we're appointed. Look at these issues, A, B, C, D. So what do we do as an ombudsman? We call up the supervisor and say, this is what we're hearing. Can you address this? And they've all addressed these issues. So we've never had to come in and say to the supervisor, you know, stand aside, we're taking over, because that's not how we work as an office. So to sum up, school board oversight, there's no, there's no timeline um, set for the implementation of Bill 8. Uh, we will refer complainants to the school board first. We, deal, we will deal with both individual and bigger systemic issues. We will serve as an alternative dispute resolution. We're not an advocate appeal or regulatory body or tribunal and we will deal with a lot of the issues that you've seen have uh, made it to um, the public forum in the last few years. I invite you to, uh, if you're not already there, follow us on Facebook. We post uh, developments. If you want to know when Bill 8 will be proclaimed, we will be hopefully the first ones to uh, provide you that information. Our Twitter account, we now have a French one as well, since a couple weeks ago. This presentation and most of my speeches are uploaded to YouTube, and we have an electronic newsletter called The Watchdog. So I invite you to follow us and follow us on social media. Um, in particular, if you're interested about Hydro One, it should be um, released uh, very shortly, that report. So.